Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you for um, welcoming us, us here to this wonderful room. We're here to talk about a book, though, um, by uh, one of our brilliant speakers, Athene Donald, who is the master of my college, Churchill, um, has written this book, Not Just for Boys, Why We Need More Women in Science. And as well as Athene, we have Tabitha Goldstaub, who was chair of the um, government's AI Council and now uh, runs Innovate Cambridge. And so I'm an economist. Tabitha has uh, had her career in the tech business, and Athene is a physicist. All very male-dominated disciplines, and that's why we thought it would be quite interesting to bring us together. So we're going to have um, a, a bit of to and fro amongst ourselves here, and then open it up for uh, conversation with all of you. And I wanted to start with you, Athene, as we're here to uh, celebrate the book, which is available for purchase later, I have to add. Um, tell us why you wrote it, and uh, can you give us kind of enough of a synopsis to entice people to buy it without giving it all away? Okay, so I was um, the university's gender equality champion from 2010 till 2014. And before that, I run the Women in Science, Engineering and Technology Initiative in the university. And during that time, I read an awful lot of the social science about why there aren't enough women in science. And when I say science, it probably should distinguish physical sciences from biological sciences. And I'd include tech, engineering in the physical sciences, because there are differences to some extent. Um, but anyhow, as a physicist, I was acutely aware there weren't many women in my subject. There hadn't been many women in my subject when I was an undergraduate back in the 70s. And the number of women doing physics in Cambridge has crept up to the princely sum of about 23%. So it's not brilliant. I, I, I felt, I feel very frustrated that despite you know, this college, all, all the formerly male colleges, having admitted women, we're still in this position, and the problems start really early. So my book is sort of split into two halves, as the early years, what goes wrong in the way children are brought up, in the way schooling interacts with boys and girls, the messages that children receive and the stereotypes they see around them. So that's the early part of the book. And then there's the second half, which um, considers what happens if you try to have an academic career in these subjects and why, even though the numbers in the biological sciences start off healthy, they still fall away. And by the time you're looking at professor, not that much difference between the physical and the biological sciences. So there are different problems at different stages in life, but basically they're all problems and they all act to deter women from starting out and then keeping going, as it were. So can you give us one of the um, anecdotes that um, you recount in the book about, about your own experience and how you became aware. I mean, not that it was absolutely terrible, and some people do have terrible experiences, yes. but enough to make you aware that there were these barriers. So, I mean, I'm a physicist, but I was a kind of weird physicist. I worked on starch, which isn't a very normal material for a physicist to work on. And the kinds of comments I got, oh, it's just domestic science, that's all you're mm -hmm. capable of doing. Um, you try giving a talk about Kit Kat wafers to an audience of physicists, and you know, maybe, maybe you know, they do think it's a bit odd, but um, it was absolutely derogatory. Um, it's trying to put me in my place. And it was, you know, it's just endless. So there was a time, uh, I can't even remember what the story was about, but the local newspaper interviewed me, and they interviewed my head of department, um, and it was a man. And, um, it was a woman who did the interviewing, but I was referred to as Athena Donald, although I carefully used my full um, appellation, you know, Professor Dane, in the signature, which I often take out, because I'm silly. But um, I was Athena Donald, he was Professor. And, you know, it's just that kind of thing that society always, not always, frequently diminishes women in these utterly unconscious ways. I have to tell you, my first job was in the Treasury, and I pitched up, full of myself, because I'd just got my PhD, and um, they had circulation lists, so it's Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, and I said, I'm going to be Ms. Ms. Coyle, and they said, no, you can't, you're going to be Miss. I said, oh, in that case, I'll be Doctor, um, which is kind of trivial, but um, it turned out I was the only person with a PhD, so that was rather <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> How does that resonate with you, Tabitha, in the tech world? Uh, 
the number of times my assistant gets invited to meetings because he was a boy, and then and then they turn up and be like, oh, we thought James was coming. I'd be like, oh, no, no, I wasn't arranging the meeting. James is <laughs> and that you know that's been my whole life. So uh, that that wasn't really what worried me the most. I think what worried me in the alarm bells that started ringing when I got into artificial intelligence was this was annoying, but it could also lead to significant deaths for half of the population if we weren't getting um, more equality into artificial intelligence, which effectively is mimicking all of these problems and exacerbating them. So for me, that's when the real alarm bell started ringing and I saw myself as a bit of an amplifier of those alarm bells. And there's incredible women like Evie who's working on, who've been working on this for, for years. And so I sort of ran around uh, town shouting, listen, listen to these, listen to these people. So I'm thrilled to be here today to, to do more of that. Um, the, the other piece that I have really tried is to think about the spaces that women can occupy within and around technology that aren't actually te being technologists themselves. Um, what kind, of, what kind of things? What kind of things? So because of the advent of things like artificial intelligence or just the digital world, most people's jobs are technical. You know, my friends who are marketing managers who say, oh, I don't like tech. And I'm like, well, you use more technology than most people I know, or nurses in hospitals who I can see them plugging in, you know, 15 algorithms. They're like, oh, I don't do, I don't do with AI. And you're like, no, I think, I think you kind of do. And I think helping and supporting women to see that they are scientists themselves has been the other aspect of this that I think is important. Um, do you think it's changing? I mean, Athena, you've been observing this um, for some time now, so improvement or not? In numbers, slowly. In awareness, much more so, I would say. I think, certainly, um, when I started getting involved in this, people thought it was a woman's problem. Mm. They did not understand. I mean, when you say AI has problems, I think people are aware they don't know yeah. what to do about it and they're not very good at handling it, but they are aware and I think that has changed. I would like to think that the average young person growing up, heading off into a career, is much more aware than they used to be. So I think, yeah, it is changing, but it's just slow. Mm -hmm. And the system, I mean, the problem is the system, which will take a very long time to turn around. Well, let, let's turn to um, what might be done and the sort of upbringing and education questions when, when people are small and perhaps a little bit more malleable. I mean, Tabitha, you have a, a young son. Um, how do you think about what his attitudes will be when he's turning into a scientist later? It's... Um it's really interesting. I feel very lucky. My, my son's four, and um, he mainly gravitates towards really powerful young women. <laughs> and so I get to spend time with amazing young girls, watching them and him interact mm -hmm. with um, all of these STEM opportunities that are out there. And yes, of course, there are rows of boys' toys and girls' toys, but there are also rows of science toys, and they are not gendered in the same way. One of the things I found interesting that I mentioned um, before was books about female scientists are woven into them, the challenges that those female scientists had getting to where they are. And I thought that was wonderful until I had a son who I was reading to, and then the men wouldn't let the woman into the library. And you're like, oh, should I be reading that? And I've stopped reading them. But before I had a son, I thought this was great. We should be telling the world how oppression has been, and we should be, you know, hidden figures, for example. We should be banging everyone on the, over the head with it. But as a young, impressionable boy, I didn't want to preempt the fact that he might think that girls weren't superior to boys, which he currently believes. <laughs> um, and so I'm in a quite an interesting, maybe personal mm -hmm. challenge there. Um, and as you say, Athena, things have changed. And I wonder, what is the next wave of this? Like, what is the next wave of the storytelling where um, we resign some of that language around what boys and girls can and can't do or could and couldn't do to a history bucket rather than to a future bucket? Mm -hmm. So I was at the Cambridge Computer Sci Science Museum. I think that's what it's called, the one near the Beehive. And there was a lot of, girls can do it too. I was like, Jesus Christ, are they really? Like, I was a bit worried. I was like, I don't want to tell. I don't want to tell them they can do it too. I just want it to be a de facto thing. And I'm, I'm at a very interesting balance. Because only a year ago, I believed that girls can do it too was the answer. And I'm starting to feel less like that. 
and I would like it to be a bit more a given. It's very interesting. Um, economics also has a similar problem. Um, and as you go up the academic ladder, there are fewer and fewer uh, women. Um, and when I was at Manchester, we had a really uh, concerted initiative, which then grew into a Royal Economic Society initiative to get more women to study economics at each stage. Um, and we started by going into schools, into local high schools. And by that stage, the girls had already lost interest because they thought it was all about money. So in a sense, we had already yes. lost that PR battle about what the subject is all about. And, and it's, it's boring and you ha you're going to wear a suit and go and make some money. Yeah. So I think it does start early. Yeah. But that's a really interesting point you raised. What do you think, Nadine? Mm -hmm. I think it starts incredibly early. Um, so I'm a bit past the four-year-old child stage, but I have a four-year-old granddaughter. Um, and her older sister, who was six at the time, you know, we've got some wonderful wooden bricks that, that were my mother's, so they're old and fantastic. And she was happily playing with them. I said, oh, do you do this at school? And she said, oh, the, there is a construction corner, the boys play there. Mm -hmm. And clearly no teacher had said, that's for you too. So I think that is yeah. still a problem. Yeah. I think children are uh, sort of separated in the school system mentally, I mean, not literally, mm. but if the boys are playing with the bricks and the girls are playing with the paints mm. or the glitter or, you know, whatever, it, it gives them a message about what is right for them. And I think, you know, nice middle-class parents can try and overcome that and choose the books and all mm. the rest of it. And so I've got some long books about Rosie Revere, the Riveter. Have you come across yeah. this? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter likes those. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so... You know, you can try and overcome it, but it is so embedded. And one of the frustrations I have about my book is that I'm not aware it's really penetrating the teacher market, yeah. if you like. Mm. And so I, I went to talk to Carol Monaghan, who is a, a SNP MP somewhere in Glasgow, and she was a physics teacher before she became an MP, and she was saying, you really have consciously so she was talking about 12, 14 year old girls, you really have consciously to draw them in because they've already got that message that, you know, that's not for them. So I think the challenges do start incredibly young. I hadn't realised that was true of economics too. I thought at university the numbers started off sort of equal and, and then it's one of the subjects where they fall off afterwards. But you're saying even at school it's... Well, the ones who... That's true about undergraduate degrees, but they have um, self-selected in out of a larger pool yeah. at school. Right. Um, but if, if we've got this structural problem that starts early, um, what do you think the sort of structural interventions might be? Do you have strategies for tackling Well, I mean, this? one of the things, and I've said this over and over again, is if Ofsted's going to go to schools and inspect them, why don't they ask them about what they're doing around countering stere stereotypes, for instance? Um, one thing that the Institute of Physics showed was that if you went to a single-sex school, girls were far more likely to progress to A-level physics than if you go to a co-ed school. And <coughs> my um, fairly violent disagreement with Catherine Babel Singh when she presented evidence to the um, inquiry on diversity and inclusion in STEM last summer, she was saying, oh, you know, it's, it's, we've got good teachers, of course there's nothing stopping the girls doing physics, they don't like the hard maths. And, think, oh, and her school actually had a lower <laughs> proportion of girls going on to A-level physics than the national average. So, you know, she wasn't trying. So I think you've got to get some kind of um, a sort of intervention that will ensure that teachers don't allow stereotypes to propagate without um, anyone saying anything. And, you know, it's as true of boys doing languages, for instance. Boys are deterred from doing languages and psychology, um, and you can see this in the A-level entries. My son's English teacher at age 11 said to us, well, boys can't write. And you think, <laughs> what? I mean, I'm sure there are quite a lot of boys who've been writing in here. Um, and, and it's just appalling that teachers can do this. They're all just right off yeah. one and a half of the population or the other. I was horrified to be on Woman's Hour, and one of the other speakers said, well, of course we all hate maths, don't we? <gasps> so even in um, the Holy of Holies of Woman's Hour, that, <laughs> that kind of uh, thing is said. Yes. So one of the arguments people make is that, um, sure, there are some structural impediments, but really it's up to women to, to do something about themselves, and we should be um, demanding more, leaning in, as it were. So I'd like to get your views about that. 
You're, you're laughing, Tabitha, you can start. <laughs> We're both furious, you go first. <laughs> um, so leaning in the Sheryl Sandberg sense, which is quite the same perhaps, um, it strikes me as, as I said yesterday, a version of victim blaming, that saying the women aren't trying hard enough and it, it's all their fault and if only they just stand up and be counted, everything would be fine. And you think, no, the system doesn't let them do that. If you stand up and be counted, you're told you're aggressive, you're not likeable, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, in terms of, you know, should, can a girl lean in and choose physics? Well, of course she can, but if she's told she doesn't really fit in, she's not going to stick it out, is she? Particularly if she then meets um, sort of negative comments from, the, from her peer group or her teachers or whatever. I mean, it's just not that simple. No, particularly for teens and young adults yes, who want to conform to their groups. Exactly. Yeah. I think the bit that makes me laugh is the, the moment in uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, apparently her revelation moment was when she was pregnant, um, walking across the car park because she had a car parking space at the wrong side of Facebook and you were like, are you serious? It took you this long to realise that you have been a, in an oppressive environment and now you're going to do something about it for all the other women? And I think that's why I laugh. There is just no self-awareness of the systemic failure to include people rather than just you know, talk about quality. Um, and I think that I mean, Facebook's a great example um, uh, of it. And so I, I, I was, I'm glad that you also agree that lean in is not the solution. Um, but one thing I do think is an interesting um, part of the solution is thinking about making an environment that is somewhere that people are comfortable being. And one of the things that Ottilene Leiser talks about a lot that I really like, she's the CEO of UKRI, is thinking about science um, and technology like you would football. And so she described it to this government, because they quite like the football analogy, as yes, you might have Pele, but you also have got people who kick around footballs on the weekend. And what I have noticed as... Um, as someone in Cambridge, as, as someone with two children, as someone who is themselves never felt comfortable in the science, technology, maths world growing up, I love citizen science. I really love being asked to do a volcano experiment. <coughs> and those sorts of, you know, when you put the red dye and the baking powder, those sorts of things, I think, um, when attached to actually solving problems, I've noticed the difference with gender. So my son's very happy just making a volcano explode versus telling a story to his female friends that say, okay, actually, how are we going to make sure that we save the people around the volcano? <laughs> or what are the key steps to ensuring success for this group of people? Those kind of things, coming back to your point about The Economist, I think that's what Raspberry Pi certainly have seen and I, I was working with them for a while, is that if they approach this from a solutions perspective, rather than from a like, big data or exciting, big, hairy bomb, women are generally quite excited. And I think that that's the angle that probably works the best. So we just need to, the sort of funding for that, over and above funding you know, bigger data sets, might be an interesting way of thinking about, about it. There's a very depressing book called Women Don't Ask. I think Linda Babcock was one of oh, the wow. authors. Mm -hmm. And um, her uh, evidence showed that one of the reasons that women were not paid as much as men for doing comparable jobs was that they didn't ask for a pay rise. And men, supremely confident, would ask for the pay rise. The catch was that if a woman did ask for a pay rise, she would be more likely to get it, but they wouldn't like her. But that, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I said. The likability thing, like, it yeah. just isn't an issue for men. So that's why leaning in doesn't work. There was a, a study done at Stanford about academic women which trained the women to negotiate and for, for starting salaries or whatever it was. And the negotiations still tended to break down because they didn't train the administrators to accept the women coming in. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and, you know, so, and the administrators, probably a lot of them were women. Let's, let's face it, women are as prejudiced. So, so um, I think we're going to come to the audience later for more suggestions for solutions because We've identified the problem, it starts yeah. early, it's quite intractable, I'm not sure we've got good solutions to it yet. Um, but I want to ask why it matters. And um, economics is a social science, and it seems to me it really matters there because um, you don't even know what questions you should be addressing, what data you should be gathering, 
the, the kind of experience that informs the choices that people make and, and so on. So for social science, I think it's really bad not to be representative. And it isn't just in terms of women, it's members of ethnic minority groups and actually members of pe people from um, lower income groups as well. Um, you started to talk a bit about AI, Tabitha, so can you say more about why the really uh, male Silicon Valley environment of, of technology is a problem? I think there's, there's um, two, two, two strands. One is exactly what you've just described in social sciences, but on steroids. So what data, what questions, all of those problems where effectively um, the AI is learning from the existing biases that we already have. I think the other thing is it becomes a world where po like polarized, popular, bro, I like the fact that you used boys, not men, on your book. Um, that environment, I think he creates a really bad environment for con equality and any kind of um, redistribution of the wealth that's being created. And we've seen that with Silicon Valley, we've seen that with uh, generally um, these, these eight billionaires versus the eight billion people being affected by um, things, or everything, but things like artificial intelligence. So I think there's sort of those, those dual problems. The immediacy of if you have models that do not recognize black faces because no one ever checked, <laughs> and Joy Borwami and the work she's doing, but then there's also just the bigger existential challenge of if we don't have the right people in the room, who's talking any truth to any kind of power? We've seen that obviously playing out recently. There's um, a wonderful TED talk by the late Hans Rosling about washing machines and what a difference that made to um, his life because it freed up so much of his mother's and grandmother's time. Fei Fei Lee at Stanford is now starting to think about this AI thing, what if we applied it to things people do in the household? But other, up till now it's been, have an app to get your pizza faster. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Does it matter in physics? I think, I think, the same it, way. I think it matters less in physics, but physicists go on to do all kinds of things. And so it is, you know, you need diversity on boards, you need diversity in anywhere where you are problem solving. Um, and it certainly matters in biological sciences. I mean, pharma has lost a lot of money from bringing drugs to market and then discovering that they either don't work on women or cause problems, side effects that they hadn't thought. I mean, the idea that hormones are a bit of a nuisance, so we won't use women in the studies, it just it beggars belief. And yet that was the philosophy, you know, that their hormones are cyclical, so we can't use them to test them. <laughs> and you think, oh my goodness me. And so I think it matters everywhere because there are many um, perspectives on any given problem. And if you only have one kind of person thinking up solutions, you're going to miss all kinds of things. Uh, what about the differences between the sciences? I know um, you've talked about physics and engineering, um, but you just went on to the biomedical sciences. And I think you said earlier they were a little bit better. Um, well, if you look at our vet school, for instance, about 80% women at undergraduate level um, in the biological sciences, probably about 60%. So in that sense, it's better. You might worry, why aren't men coming to read veterinary sciences? That's a different question. Mm. But you still find the numbers fall off at every stage, that the academic ladder... Um, I mean, people talk about the leaky pipeline, and you can argue if, whether or not that's a good analogy, but the leaks go on in biology, so that, as I say, by the time you get to professorial level, the numbers are wildly different from, from in physics, although the numbers started off much lower. Um, and I think the environment, I mean, one of the things I found astonishing when I was uh, producing this book was there are lots of apparently objective metrics on an academic career path, um, which you would think, therefore, there can't be any difference. The fact that it takes longer for women's papers to get through the editorial process. I just, I mean, the Royal Society of Chemistry did a study of their own journals and showed this was absolutely true. Does someone look at it? Does an editor look at a paper and say, oh, it's got a woman as a first author. I'm going to put it in that heap and not look at it for three weeks. I just don't understand how this comes True of economics journals as well. Yes. Yeah. And so these objective metrics, it's not, no longer about success rates for grants, which by and large, possibly with the exception of economics, um, are pretty much at parity. But women tend to get smaller grants. Um, 
if women take longer to get promotion, you can argue, is that because they didn't lean in, or is it because they're, they've taken some time out to have children? Or, you know, it's really hard to deconstruct some of these issues. Um, but I think the fact that the numbers fall off are because these objective metrics really aren't as objective as <coughs> promotion panels would like to think, for instance. And COVID, I think, was quite interesting. Am I right? For academics where women's papers halved and men's papers went up by 10%, which for me was, I don't know whether that's something that you would have counted as interesting, but that to me would just show exactly what but, was but happening. But the to longer I term, yeah. I know that was the early yes. analysis, the longer term yes. data didn't particularly did support. Okay. And it did seem to vary between disciplines, so it's right. slightly harder to... I haven't gone back and it checked. It supported what I saw. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my I first like, reaction this was, is what my friends are doing Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, that's interesting. I'll look it up. Yeah. Uh, yes. I don't know where, the, where it's settled. So <clears throat> I think we should come to the audience um, and uh, take some comments and questions. Um, so we've got people, I know we've got economists in the room, and I should think we've got people from these other disciplines in the room as well. And um, we don't have microphones, but you can just stand up and shout. And I can't see at the back, so if you're at the back, you're going to have to wave your hand. So, uh, one, su uh, one, one suggestion and then a question. One suggestion, would OUP like to donate a copy of your book to every school in the land? Mm -hmm. uh, possibly mm. with some materials, I think that that would be well received. Um, secondly, what can our university do? Um, so I feel that uh, we can signal uh, our values <coughs> and we do that through having net zero uh, 2048, I think. Um, also, we're interested in disadvantaged groups, uh, rightly so, and um, some of what we mentioned. But to what extent could our university do more to narrow the gap in some of the undergraduates who are coming in the gender mix? And finally, uh, without wanting to be too self-interested, what about the pay gaps uh, in gender in our university? Um, so we do have the PVC whose responsibility <laughs> it is here. And you know, I think the university has been trying. The gender pay gap is, I mean, it's problematic because of course, it's great segregation that there is not much gender pay differential between people at the same level if you exclude market bonuses and all the rest of it. So the gender pay gap, I think, always looks worse than it is because the reality is there are more men at the top and more women doing the sweeping the floors at the bottom. Um, I think it tries. I, um, I mean, I know when I was a gender equality champion, the then PVC, Jeremy Sanders, you know, was really helpful and a lot of things were instigated. I do think that there is too much of a disconnect between the, um, I've forgotten his name, gender, gender equality steering group, is that it? And the, the centre, I think there's not enough continuity there and I have said that on various occasions. Um, we are at parity across the university as a whole. We are not at parity, say, in computing, uh, where I don't know what the current percentage is. It's probably 10 or 15 percent. Um, that's a school problem. There is a limit to what the university can do about that. I mean, departments and disciplines surely have a role to play themselves. And the Royal Economic Society is trying to do so across, across economics departments across the country. And that's happening in, in the US as well. Um, we didn't touch on it, but the gender gap the other way seems a problem also. I mean, in, if psychology is so female-dominated, yes. the same kinds of issues yes. must occur in reverse. Absolutely. Pay women more, maybe. I like that suggestion. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> um, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Manas, um, and I work as an EDI manager at the Cambridge Edge Business School. I think for me, this issue that keeps coming up again and again about the schools is really important and when we have events like this I think there needs to be invitations to the schools to come and join us and I've kind of applied this model last year for events we had because the schools need to be here too to hear this and be a part of this and I'd like to see the university doing more work with the schools to really raise awareness of the issues which because I see it with myself I'm mother of three daughters 
and even with my five-year-old, mommy, pink is for girls and blue is for boys. I, I'm not saying that, it's coming from the schools. Yeah. So I think more work from the university um, as a role model, I suppose, to really influence the schools would be really good and useful. Dorothy Burnett, Murray Edwards, ran a, a, a Women in STEM festival two or three weeks ago, and she did ask Hills Road people on one day, on the second day she invited um, girls from a school in East London. So she was trying quite I, hard. I think my daughter was up. Right. Please. Hi, Dad. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Izzy. Um, I wanted to share an anecdote um, and, and see what you made of it, um, Athene, particularly having read the, the kind of social science. So I was lucky enough um, early on in my career, I worked in um, software engineering and data science. Um, before that, I studied physics. Um, and there was a, a free course for women called Code First Girls. I did just two courses. The first one was in CSS and HTML, which are the languages that you use to make websites and kind of make, uh, engaging front end. Um, and then there was a Python course, which was all about making the back end. And um, I attended both these courses, one after the other. In the first one, 30 women started and about 29 finished and submitted pro um, um, projects. And in the second one, 30 women started and about nine finished. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, there was something about <coughs> not being able to immediately see the results of what, um, what you were doing. And, um, you know, the, uh, the not, not foreseeing that you could join the first bit to the second bit and make it useful. Um, mm -hmm. So what I took away from it was this idea that um, firstly sticking with it and the kind of discomfort of it, but also something about not seeing and feeling which maybe perhaps comes back to that question of, you know, what you can do with the fact, you know, STEM mm -hmm. being useful. But I just wanted to leave that um, anecdote with you and see whether it kind of rung any notes mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. social science mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I would worry a bit about how it was being taught. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, it, it may be more for you, because you must see this all the time. In your I world. think that's the Raspberry Pi analogy, where they've, they've found that if they tell someone to program Raspberry Pi, it's, they'd lose the girls, but if they tell them to make something that looks for um, uh, planet erosion in the plants in a specific tree at the Botanic Gardens, it seems to work. So I, I, I think they are finding that that is, that is the case. Do I want that to be the case universally? When you're, while you're telling the story, I panic, because I'm like, should that be the case universally? Because is that a systemic problem that are we just exasperating? And then equally, I know from my case, I would definitely have probably been the one that didn't continue Python, because I wouldn't have felt that I was being useful. So I think... Um, the economist in me says we need the male figures as well. How many of the men yeah. who took an equivalent course would have dropped out? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, maybe it is just generally harder. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're in danger of doing the stereotyping ourselves. Yeah. What is it? I mean, you did it as an adult, I take it. Mm -hmm. So everything that has been thrown at you yeah, beforehand has told you, you need to think about mm. this way, whereas men are content to get mm. themselves in a, a silo and just program. And so, you know, I, I don't like the idea that we are inherently yeah. soft and cuddled. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> no, that, that's my concern. That, that yeah. it starts so early. The best think. thing, though, is AI means. I mean, no one's going to need to do any paper Python at all. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let the boys, sorry men in the room, you guys keep doing the Python, that's great. <laughs> da, 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 da. We'll just chat to our machines and we'll make them do what we need. And I, I mean, I generally do think that AI is a game-changing yeah. moment for women's, women and people who identify as women and who have had the kind of... Uh, experience of being women and told they're doing just doing the fluffy things it's a great moment this is the time to do the fluffy bits yeah. excellent um kamal and then i'm going to stand up and look for the hands at the back which i can vaguely see so i have a, I have a question just on that um, but before that i mean just to reassure some people there, there are attempts that are being made <laughs> uh, to reduce the gender pay gap and uh, the equal pay gap as you pointed out is is very very low about two percent or uh, or so, but the, there is a gender pay gap primarily because you, as you mentioned, of grade segregation. 
But other than that, I mean, so the way we do promotions, for example, we are changing um, to, to not just encourage, but really push uh, heads of institutions to, to look out for people who normally don't apply for promotions. And, and we know from empirical evidence, women, ethnic minorities, you know, will be less likely to apply for promotions and so on. So it, they really need to look uh, at those and to get representation up in school councils, in, uh, in statutory committees, and, uh, and on market pay, which is the other thing that you mentioned. So for every case that is made, so we ask them to tell us whether it will improve or deteriorate the gender pay gap in, uh, in the, or, and the ethnicity uh, pay gap. And that is one of the things that, this, uh, that determines the outcome. But coming to the question, right? I mean, so you mentioned, you know, sort of with AI, how things might change. Now, I think you mentioned early on too. I mean, we know that social hierarchies, right, whichever way uh, they go, they become embodied in technologies. And uh, so, as important as representation of women is, equally important is how we look at technology. Right? And, and, and see them as socially constructed. And, uh, and because, I mean, so to give you an example from racial uh, hierarchies, for example, in the 1950s when Kodak came out with, uh, with color film, black people used to appear green on, uh, on screen. Mm -hmm. And that is because when they were doing the chemistry for those films, they had to make trade-offs, right? I mean, so a certain configuration of chemicals could capture pale skin better uh, but not black skin. And, uh, and there was another configuration that could capture black skin better, but not pale skin. So they made the trade-off in, in one direction, and, and so on. And, and we have lots of literature on how technologies reflect and embody uh, gender-based hierarchies and, and so on. But as far, you know, when, when people are doing the work, whether it's men, women, something, you know, sort of um, other genders, um, we can develop a facility for critical thinking and overcome our biases. But when this becomes embodied, these social relationships in algorithms and in technologies, technologies don't have the facility for critical thinking. So will it improve the situation or fossilize or, uh, or worsen it? That's a very big question. Yes. <laughs> so, shall I start? Uh, I've not had a chance to talk to you about this. Yeah. Um, I'm quite concerned about the way automated decision systems are being used in areas like um, ranking people for medical treatments, for kidney yeah. transplants and so on. And in fact, there was a very good FT article about this last weekend. Um, because people are not thinking hard enough about exactly how they code the objective function, because the systems are unbelievably efficient, they will absolutely deliver what you encode into them as the objective function. There's been a lot of focus on the data bias and the training data, much less on how do you frame exactly what the problem is that you want to address. And that raises some really deep questions about um, the nature of justice or how you prioritise different groups of people. So the example in the FT article was that a, a, a new algorithm for determining, I think it was kidney transplants, um, position in the queue, um, had been framed to uh, increase the remaining, um, maximise the increase in the remaining life years of the candidate patient. And that meant that anybody young was pushed to the back of the queue. Now that's the kind of decision that you might think is a valid decision or not, but it ought to be made consciously, and I think it's being made unconsciously. Mm. Um, I've been thinking, I'm not sure it's an answer to the question, but I've been thinking about that. Yeah, and I think um, this is why there's, this is why it's such a hot topic with our politicians at the moment, <laughs> because ultimately this is going to need the right kind of regulation, and there isn't, uh, there isn't today a really good answer for how to do that. And we've got our bros in the valley, our you know, eight billionaires, making decisions for the eight billion and um, ensuring that more people understand the, deci the decisions that these machines are making and then therefore can vote with their wallets, their feet, <laughs> vote with their actual you know, polling cards, I think is probably, I worry, one of the places where this is going to play out. 
um, and the only the, the 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 sort of the thing that ensures that I can sleep at night is thinking through the civil society organisations that are working on this, or people like Diane and the Bennett Institute thinking through where are where is the resistance and going to come from, and where are the people who are really deeply thinking about this, um, and how do we crowd more around them, more funding around them, so that then effectively we do have answers to thorny and almost impossible intractable problems so that our regulators can start to think through how they're going to find ways to regulate. Uh, I know there are other people at the front, we'll have time, but I'm going to stand up and see who's at the back. Yes, two people at the back there, one after the other. Yes, please, yes. I'm sure that's right. I mean, there, there have been, there's been work looking at how teachers interact in the classroom. And, um, you know, girls stereotypically sit quietly, all the rest of it. The boys are jumping up and down. And so the teacher draws the boys in and leaves the girls. And so then it feels like it's not proper for me to put myself forward. I think it is something that's probably inculcated quite young. Um, and that, that comes back to the fact that teachers need to be more aware. They're not doing it consciously. It's probably crowd control as much as anything sometimes. If you've got through school and you're at university or you're starting yeah. your PhD, is it something we need to think about um, in terms of mentoring or training? Yeah, I students? think so. I mean, one of the things I gave a talk in Edinburgh to. Um, it was a, a very mixed audience, but there were some philosophers there. And they said, we always don't start Q&A for about three minutes to give everyone time to think of their questions, and then we find more women ask questions. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Now, there was another hand uh, right near you. So, yes, go ahead. a version of the lean in problem isn't it um, it worries me I mean it's great to see so many women here but I would have liked to see more men uh, I, think it's, I think it's relatively good <laughs> I mean I don't know what kind of women's events you go to but I was quite impressed at how many men there are here um, because it absolutely is for them and I I, I talked um, at an event in Selwyn and over the dinner afterwards, it was really encouraging to hear the young men mm. say how much this mattered to them. Mm. Um, perhaps because of their partners, perhaps because of their children, but they were terribly conscious of it. And it really is something we're all in together. Mm. Um, you know, I, I always make a point of flipping it and saying, look at the fact that men aren't doing languages, they aren't joining, you know, becoming vets, because I think it's important to realise this is a problem for society and it cuts both ways, and men are disadvantaged too. The culture in um, economic seminars has been notoriously aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's getting better, but certainly much better. Um, but when I was a graduate student, um, the, you'd, you'd, anybody nervous, and that was all the females, would sit back and try not to, get to put their heads above the parapet because of the aggression that would unleash. Mm -hmm. It was only a few men who were like that, mm -hmm. and none of the others intervened. So. I think it's almost not on the ones who are the aggressors, but the ones who don't say anything, who need, who need to pile in. The head of department should have piled in, for example. I mean, I think in any situation, if you see bad behaviour, you're complicit if you do nothing. 
that, I mean, I, I, I use that more particularly in the context of bullying and harassment, but it, I mean, that is bullying. Okay, others um, at the front here, thank you. Yeah, I've not been involved in this work for about 20 years, but so I'm really interested to hear, you know, some of the same things going on. Um, in 2020, I was involved, I was, the, I was the director of the Athena Project, and we had an aim to encourage more women from postgraduates to professors. And I, I mean, um, I listen to the radio and things now, and I think, gosh, we haven't done too badly, because there's a lot more women out, out there. Um, but we had the money, and we, I, I wrote the strategy, and we launched it. And a key thing is we had the support of a lot of men as well, <coughs> in senior positions, as well as some good women. So we went nationally, the Royal Society supported it. So you need things like that. And I had hoped that, and I felt that, you know, there are a lot more women going up the system. I'm sure there's a long way to go. And I go back to, I studied, <coughs> I lectured in engineering mathematics in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And I got a Churchill Travelling Fellowship to go to the steps and see what they were doing there because there had a lot more women engineers there. And we learnt a lot. I came back and I wrote role model brochures, got money from the DTI, we went into schools. And with the Women's Engineering Society, we did a lot as well. <coughs> But, you know, you keep going, you keep hearing the same stories. And, um, well, I think what I was told in the States, and I always think about this, and I should probably, I should wash my mouth in an organisation like this, <laughs> is what you need to get as well is the average woman coming into science and engineering. And for that to be okay. Because there are a lot of average men out there in it. <laughs> but um, women feel that have to be better. So I want to be enthusiastic and I, I listen, you know, and I went into schools and talked to the 13 year olds and the 16 year olds. And I took the undergraduates because mm -hmm. even at 27, you can be too far achievement levels apart mm -hmm. from the people you're talking to. They need to be able to relate to you in some way. And if you say, oh, I have a PhD in this, that, and the other fluid dynamics, or something, oh, God, what the hell is that? I can't do that. And why should they try and totally relate to that? Mm. I don't know if I've been very positive in a way, but I think it's to keep going and get the more women, that, and men, and men, the people who help me, not necessarily totally in my career, but in terms of doing things and changing the system, you need to get the people with the power on board. And thankfully, there are more women in power. Yeah. And I also worked with PA Cambridge Economic Consultants at one stage. <laughs> and whereas I was, there was only a few women there as well, it was very similar to being in the uh, Edwin Mass Department as well. But, uh, I think this is a good moment. Me. <laughs> a good moment to test the mood and see how many people are feeling optimistic about progress. So can we have a share of hands? Who's feeling optimistic? Okay. Who's feeling <laughs> pessimistic? That's about even, I think. Quite a few don't know. So. I liked how optimistic the hands were like, not <laughs> <laughs> and the pessimistic was like, oh, no. I felt the same. <laughs> okay. Um, who would like to come in next? Uh, yes, right here. Yeah. There we are. <laughs> Understood. There we Thank are. you for coming along. That's the challenge. Anyway, do please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate hearing what all of you have to say, so thank you for sharing your insights and your experiences. Um, I'm curious about what the absence of women um, and people who identify with a whole range of genders, what that absence does in shaping some of the norms of your respective disciplines. Like, are there particular ways of knowing that you would say are sort of filtered through a patriarchal logic mm -hmm. that inform some of what is taken for granted in science and law? 
doing events in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. So when I got to Cambridge, I said, I will not do any events in the evening. I just had um, a, a daughter. And, and then I've slowly crept up to like one a week. And I want to go back to none. Mm. And it's, I do think that's a, that's, that is one of the... I'm embarrassed when I talk to the two men I work with and I tell them, can we just not make it, you know, a lunch thing? Mm-hmm. And they're like, what about breakfast? You know, 8.30. I'm like, who takes your kids to school? Mm-hmm. I, uh, sorry, but the lady said, that's you, you literally answered your question. Um, that's something that I really f- feel quite acutely at the moment. So mm-hmm. I'm sure it <laughs> doesn't feel like that forever. But that's one of the things. You must have many others, though. Sorry. Well, I think it's not... It's not a woman's way of knowing, but it may be a woman's way of interacting with other people. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, so some of you may have come across Simon Baron Cohen, who um, who wrote a book about the extreme male brain. Mm. There was a a sort of interactive quiz um, that would tell you where you were on the sort of male-female spectrum that he invented. And I thought, well, let me explain why I feel so uncomfortable in the physics department, because obviously I've got a few, oh no, not at all, I still came up. But I think the way um, I tried to interact with people was different. And the way they interacted with me. Uh, um, so I think there are all kinds of social bits that are as important as anything about you know, what you know. And I think that's true in any discipline. But something you and I have talked about before, is this uh, conception of what brilliance is. Oh, yeah. So why don't you explain Okay, that? so uh, it's some studies. There's, there was a, a study done defining brilliance in some way, and I couldn't possibly tell you how they did it, but they looked at brilliance versus the percentage of women doing PhDs in that subject, both in the arts and the humanities, social sciences, and mm. in the STEM <laughs> subjects. And the more people thought you had to be brilliant to do mm. it, the fewer women. So economics, physics, philosophy, philosophy, oh um, and um, computing. You know, they were all regarded. You had to be brilliant to do them, and there weren't many women. But what I found really most depressing was a, a study done by a different group who looked at what children thought, and they they used the phrase, you know, how smart do you think boys and girls are? And at five, boys and girls thought boys and girls were equally smart. By seven, the girls thought the boys were smarter. Really? And it, you know what happened? So, and, and you know, they, they, if if a seven-year-old girl was given a game that was, she was told, you know, this will see how smart you are. She didn't want to play with it. Mm. Well, so, school happens. School. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe that's it. Yes. Well, one thing that um, on, on this point, I um, uh, I wrote a book called How to Talk to Robots, and one of the things I tried to do was reframe the not just Ada Lovelace, but other women that had been involved in artificial intelligence. And so I had the cult of the lone genius, so all the men mm-hmm. had done things typically alone, or at least they had claimed to be alone, as you describe them. And then the other side, I um, had an academic do some research on the, the women, and I was looking for lone geniuses. And amazing, I didn't find any, because what I found were lots of clusters of really brilliant women who came together, mm-hmm. whether it was the ENIAC or anything else, and you could see diametrically the difference because the cult of genius left these, you know, men, uh, sta- you know, standing as an impossible thing to try and be, whereas actually these women's groups were doing really powerful work. And so, talking about your swagger question, <coughs> I was thinking, the way I have swagger is because I think of myself in a group of other women, mm-hmm. and when you have that group of other women, I feel quite swaggery. Um, when I don't have that group of other women as I have across my career, I felt much more uncomfortable because I don't like thinking, I, I, similarly to those seven-year-olds, I don't really like that feeling of thinking you have to be brilliant, but thinking your group is brilliant, that's okay. I'm quite good with. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So maybe that's the yeah. swagger trick. Um, I can... Yes, please go ahead. So to that point, mm. I think that is a social thing. Mm. That's not, I don't think you were born that way. And no. the, the X chromosome kind of says that you're not brilliant. Did you know? I mean, I think that's, a, yeah. that's <clears throat> something that our society, mm. you know, our society kind of trains us to say, you know, for women, for instance. So I was, you know, I chair of Royal Society Section Committee 6, which is Molecules of Life. Right. And I was looking at 
um, you know, how a, a, a couple, the man and the woman, described their work. And the man's was, I did this, I did this, I discovered mm -hmm. this. And this was, this is a married couple who worked together, okay? And the woman said, we did this, we did this, we did this. Well, clearly they, they, they're, they're co-authors, they've done these things together. But the man said, I, and the woman said, we. Yeah. And then I pointed this out to my colleagues, and a neuroscientist said um, something about their brains. You know, I don't think that's it. I think it's a social thing. Mm -hmm. It's just. Do, do you see what I mean? Totally. You're yeah. absolutely right. And I think I'm a personally. I'm not saying that we should be okay with it, but I feel comfortable like that. Probably, as you say, because I've been yeah. uh, I've been conditioned to be like that. Yeah. There's actually a book recommendation I might give. Um, the Trouble with Lichen, which is by um, John Wyndham, and he, two scientists discover the same um, lichen that's going to help you live for, forever. And the male and the female deal with that entirely differently. And it might be an interesting book for those who, uh, who are interested in this. That, that, shall I tell them what happens? No. no. It's <laughs> really, <laughs> it's really I, it was pre the pill, and so pre women having any time. So that might give you a feel for it. It was not, I don't think, his feminist manifesto, but it is my feminist manifesto. <laughs> it was written in the 60s, which is yeah. It's very good. Uh, now, there was a disembodied hand at the back, so whoever it is, please, and, one and then I'll come to the front as well. So. I suspect there isn't a, a single answer to that, actually, because yeah. it does depend why have people split in those directions, mm. and what therefore what do you need to do to reverse that? Mm. Um, and I think it may depend on the particular situation. I mean, in the medical profession, as I understand it, if a if a, a sort of subdiscipline becomes full of women, then the pay drops, and then the men mm. don't want to do it, so they get more women. And you know, I, that it's, again, it's one of these things that doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. Mm. Um, computing, after all, started off as a subject that women, women. did, and I don't mean Ada Lovelace. Yeah. I mean in the fifties, it mm. was women who did mm. that, and and then. The, the UK civil service seems to have had a key role in making it harder and harder for women to do this because it moved from being clerical to technical and then they wouldn't pay the women the, the, the higher rates. So, you know, I think there can be all kinds of reasons for why it's happened and therefore what you might need to do to change it. Economics is very female dominated um, in Russia or used to be because um, the job of an economist in the Soviet Union was calculating the prices that you... It wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. No. Um, Lucia. Yes. Um, I think uh, maybe just one, uh, one observation. Um, so empirically, we know that the gender differences, gender pay gaps, are part of the larger inequality in different societies. So when you look at Scandinavian societies, for instance, where in general, the inequality is smaller, talking about gene coefficients, so income, wealth, access to education, and all that. Also the gender, all those different measures of gender pay gaps, or gender gaps, or gender inequality are smaller. So I think it's very important to discuss that in a, in a wider um, environment. And I mean, it's not, it, we get far away from solution because that means kind of changing the whole system, but I think in all our activities to try to to uh, close or to make that those gaps smaller 
we really have to think wider. It's about race, it's about um, um, nationalities, it's about immigrants and immigrants. And um, so I, I think it's really important to put this in a, in a wider, like a more holistic uh, vision, political. Um, a, I mean, there's like this natural experiment, uh, uh, Germany. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm German, and we had East Germany, West Germany, and it was incredibly interesting. I mean, the same, more or less, social demographic, okay, different economic um, environments and different cultures. But still, uh, when you looked at the number of women in East Germany in STEM sciences and up to professor level, I mean, it was almost equal as opposed to West Germany, where the, the situation was quite different. And that was also, um, when you looked at the, uh, the, uh, the pay gap and also at the general inequality level, it was a very big difference. So, I mean, they, almost like a natural uh, experiment, seeing those two different Germanys with, at least for the first 10 years, mm. very, very similar populations, developing a completely different direction. <coughs> it did have to do with social norms, uh, but it also had a lot to do with general. I mean, I think my, my, uh, my vote is to keep general inequality small, and then you will also be closer to gender inequality. That's very mm. interesting. And uh, what happened, um, what's happened since reunification? Uh, it stayed more or less the same in East Germany and it changed a little bit. It got a little bit better in West Germany, but that also had to do with migration from East to West mm -hmm. of this specific type of population. Really interesting example. Uh, we've got uh, time for a couple more comments. If Yes, right at the back, in blue, thank you. First of all, I have lots of interesting things as expected. Uh, I'm wondering, can you touch on a little bit of your about the situation in the university? While most of the discussion has focused on getting more women into STEM, I think there's something to be said and looked at, at least not losing sight of keeping them once they're in. A lot of my work has been looking at what happens to more women postdoc from STEM <laughs> subjects, for example, and looking at the conditions of the university, and you see that you know, one in three postdocs only in an academic position will where the others go, and it was consistently we're losing them out of science and engineering. And a lot of it was due to conditions within the university. It was either a very masculine, potentially short PI. So they left science because they didn't like the lab or they didn't like the PI. And addressing some of those questions and reconnecting them with their love of science has been quite important. But then we were talking about issues of if spaces are making you feel unwelcome and you're continuously being told you need to be mentored, i.e., you're not mm -hmm. good enough, there comes a point where you either believe it any kind of power away, or you don't believe it, and you get fed up. And so I think we've got some of those systemic issues to dismantle, to, you know, there's already, we've got difficulty getting them in, but once they're in, you know, what are we doing to keep them yeah. and strong? There has been a focus on lab culture. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, one of the things, um, Tabitha mentioned mm -hmm. oddly and nicely. One of the things she said in an event rather like this that I did with her was that um, men are frightened to get out of academia and women are frightened to stay in. <laughs> and I thought that was quite interesting. That the, you know, to some extent, it comes back to, to things you were saying about um, women liking the narrative and they can go out and do lots of different things. Um, and work with lots of different people. And therefore, they may think, I don't like this atmosphere, but there are lots of other things I can do. Why don't I leave? Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't do something about the atmosphere. And lab culture, I think, is a real issue. Um, and it's not necessarily the PI. It can be peer pressure. And that comes back to what I said earlier. I think anyone who sees bad behaviour and does nothing is complicit. If, if there is another 
postdoc who is making life difficult for the women in the group, why does someone not intervene? It is much easier for an outsider to intervene than for the victim to, to push back, be it banter or making it hard to get at the equipment or whatever it may be. I like but it has to be an, an, uh, somebody who has both the confidence and the status to be able to do that. I, I don't think status is as important. I think just saying that is not acceptable and saying it routinely and everyone joining in, I think that can be quite powerful. Um, and, and possibly even more powerful if it's peers saying that's not acceptable. Um, I think we also have to fund the structures that will help those women. I, I don't know it from a lab culture perspective or an academic perspective, from, from, a, from a business perspective. Um, there is a serious lack of um, support for women who are trying to come back from having children, for example. And we all know, we read in the press all the time, the childcare um, debt that people are getting into just to stand still, let alone get promotions. And I think the, uh, the statistics of um, having women on your board, having women in your team, making better businesses, the fact that that hasn't changed what we fund as you say, it's one of the things that really conf confuses me, but it just shows that um, the, econ the economists in, uh, in government have got, have got it all wrong. Um, but I think that, that there's something around supporting them outside of the lab as well as inside of the lab to make this something that is, um, is even possible. And I've recently joined a um, civil society organization, Philanthropy Board, and they've realized that before, obviously, <laughs> the uh, corporate world. So when they give grants, they give grants and they say, okay, and this is for you. This isn't for your um, organization, but you're an activist and we need to support you as an activist as well as the grant we're giving to the organization. And that makes them a better, grant, a better grantor. And people now want to take money more from them and they've seen that. Now we need the rest of the VC world to see that and I don't know what the comparable is that to the well, university, I but actually funding it properly. I can tell you one of the things the university has done, Kamal's obviously had to go, but um, just at the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things, I mean, it's quite a small fry, but anyone who has been away from there, I think it has to be a permanent position in the university for six months or more, for whatever reason, it might be um, child, uh, you know, uh, given birth, it might be sick leave, it might be looking after an elderly parent. You can apply for grants. Um, I it used to be 15,000, I don't know what it is now. And you can use it for essentially anything. So you can use it to pay for your mother-in-law to come with you to the conference mm -hmm. so that they will look after the baby while you're giving your paper. And the analysis done about this showed that it made people feel really valued. And it was open to men if, you know, if they'd been the one at home or if they'd been, as I say, looking after a sick parent or something. And it, and it did show that the university cared and wanted to support people. Now, as I say, it's, it's quite small fry in terms of money, but it, it was a very positive step and has been running now for 10 or 15 years, I should think, as a scheme. I think that's a good positive note to end on. So we're coming to the end of our time and the opportunity to not spill any drinks on the books. Um, I really want to thank Nicholas Bell for hosting us here in this absolutely magnificent library today. Um, I'm also... Um, uh, it, it's important I tell you about the Bennett Institute Public Policy Prize. It's open to early career researchers and policy professionals. And um, the question, which I can't remember, and, but there are cards about it at the back, it's about AI in society and policy. Uh, so please, if you're in that category or you know somebody in that category, do encourage them to have a look and um, a write us a fantastic essay. And there are um, prizes for that. And finally, I want to thank Athene and Tabitha and all of you. It's been a really, really good discussion. And um, I hope we're going away feeling a little bit positive about both the trends and the prospects. So please join me in thanking our speakers.